everyone, and welcome to our UCCAI uh, webinar tonight on mediation. Uh, I'm Mindy Knutson. I'm the executive director for the Utah chapter of CAI. And we would like to take the time to thank our diamond sponsors for 2015, um, which are Advanced Community Services, Morris Ferry, and Vile Fotheringham. Advanced Community Services is also our event sponsor for tonight. And we would like to thank them for sponsoring this event. Uh, tonight's topic is the Utah Chapter's new mediation program and resources for our alternative dispute resolution, which John Morris, a partner and attorney at Morris Ferry Law, will be presenting. So we will turn the time over to John for a great event. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mindy. Let's uh, get started. First, I'll give you a brief introduction uh, myself, just so you understand the context uh, from which I'm talking about these issues. I've been a lawyer for 21 years. Um, I've mediated probably more than 50 times with clients, uh, representing clients in mediation. Um, I've completed the 40 hours of required mediation training to be a certified mediator uh, for court purposes. And I've uh, mediated several disputes as a mediator um, in the past couple of years. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about mediation and other ways of solving problems uh, with a brief background uh, on these other ways of solving problems. And I, basically I'm going to spend about 15 minutes on three each on three different topics. The first topic will be uh, we're going to talk about the way that people solve disputes. Uh, including mediation, uh, and just get some understanding generally of what's available for the resolution of disputes. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about are the problems with traditional mediation of HOA disputes and the advantages of an HOA-specific mediation program. Uh, the final thing I'm going to talk about for about 15 minutes is a description of the mediation program that the Utah CAI chapter is implementing and walk through that and get some understanding of that program. And then the, uh, uh, for the final time, as long as we have questions, we'll take some questions and then uh, finish up. So the first, question, first thing I want to talk about are some options for resolving uh, disputes. And you, you can see by the uh, graphic on the screen, um, there are several options. Um, you have uh, facilitation, mediation, arbitration, negotiation, and end. And as, as clients, I think, generally uh, would agree, litigation pointing to the hole in the ground. Um, I'm going to walk through each one of these and talk a little bit about each one uh, just to get some background. So the, fir the first way that uh, people generally resolve disputes is through negotiation. And really, this is just people talking to each other and trying to work out their problems or disputes. Uh, there's some serious advantages to negotiating with a person you have a dispute with. The, the first and, and best advantage is it doesn't cost you anything but your time. Uh, you don't need any outside parties, not spending money on lawyers, and um, uh, if you can get the dispute resolved, you move on. Of course, uh, negotiation uh, requires people to agree on a resolution. and uh, sometimes you get that and sometimes you don't, um, which gets us to these other avenues to resolve disputes. Uh, the next thing you type of dispute resolution is uh, facilitation. Now, you don't hear much about facilitation in alternative dispute resolution lingo. It's out there. Um, basically, I, I like to think of it as mediation light. Uh, and it's really just a third party who gets involved to try to help uh, set some ground rules, to try to facilitate communication. So this might be, and it's typically going to be a friend, or in the HOA contact, context, it might be a manager or another board member, somebody like that who's, who's just getting in the dispute, who really isn't trained typically in resolving disputes, but they're just trying to facilitate a conversation, maybe 
check people if they get out of bounds and uh, as far as or, um, escalating with name calling, things like that. Just try to keep those issues under control to see if they can facilitate a conversation and get the dispute resolved. You know, some advantages of facilitation. Um, obviously, you get the dispute resolved. You typically wouldn't need an attorney. Uh, you know, you're staying out of court. Um, and, you know, these are, it's obviously a good way to go if you think it can work. Um, some disadvantages are you just have to get a third party involved. And, of course, you know, the parties have to agree, which is the, the case in a lot of these options. So if, if you've, you know, tried negotiation, if you've attempted facilitation, you're not getting anywhere, um, the next typical step is going to be medi mediation. Now, in mediation, basically what you're doing is you're involving a third party who's trained typically in dispute resolution. And, uh, you know, good mediators do have training. They understand the mediation process. And they should have tools at their disposal from that training to try to facilitate a resolution. And um, if, you, if you've been through mediation training, which I have, and the, you, you have an entire new light shed on mediation. It really is a skill and a, there are a lot of tools out there uh, to help people solve problems that you wouldn't otherwise be aware of typically. Now, when you start in mediation, it has some, some advantages and disadvantages also. Um, the first thing is you have to go get a mediator, which typically involves paying someone. And, you know, those rates can be anywhere from 75 to three or $400 an hour. Um, oftentimes, people will try to get ex-judges and, and uh, people with some credibility to uh, um, act as a mediator. And, you know, the rates can be on the higher end. So there's, there's a pretty serious expense involved in mediation. Uh, you might also, uh, if you're mediating, oftentimes you're going to have lawyers. And, and anywhere in any of these disputes, you can have lawyers uh, but for really effective mediation, it frequently requires a lawyer because the lawyers need to educate the mediator on the law and the facts, um, usually through what's called a mediation brief. And some time goes into that with presenting the legal arguments and, and the case law and the statutes, whatever law that applies, uh, to try to educate the mediator. Now, once again, with mediation, uh, it really requires the parties to agree. So if you and, it, and that's an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, you know walking into mediation, uh, nobody's going to make you agree to anything that you don't want to agree to. On the other hand, if you don't agree, if the parties don't, can't come to an agreement, you know, the mediation will be unsuccessful. An important other part about mediation or other point about mediation is it's confidential. And if the mediation is structured properly, which a good mediator should, uh, the that all the things that you say in mediation are confidential, they cannot be used in court, and the mediation, mediator can't be required to testify. So it's a, it's a great way to go. Uh, mediation can be very successful in solving problems. Uh, generally, in my view, mediation is, is really likely to be successful if negotiations have failed, and, but the parties really do want to resolve the problem. And then that's you know, usually a good time for mediation. Uh, the next way that, the, the next uh, method of solving problems that you see pretty frequently, well, not frequently, it's actually pretty infrequently, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a procedure that's used, um, it's out there, and in specific types of disputes, especially like construction and securities, it gets used a lot. The, and this is arbitration. And basically, arbitration is what I call court light, which, which means it's similar to a court process. So in arbitration, you are going to be paying a third party to uh, resolve your dispute. And now, that creates a situation where in normal court, you don't pay the judge. Uh, that's what judges, you know, the, the state pays the judge typically or the federal government, and you file your lawsuit and the judge just does their job. In mediation, you're paying the judge who's that, or, or I'm sorry, in arbitration, you're paying the arbitrator. Um, occasionally, you'll even see panels of arbitrators with three arbitrators, but the, typically, it's going to be one arbitrator. So that's a, certainly a disadvantage, and especially in smaller disputes 
or disputes with um, that are resolved earlier, that arbitration tration time can stack up. And all the time that the arbitra arbitrator spends preparing, all the time that the arbitrator spends um, communicating with the parties, and then, of course, rendering decisions or listening to evidence or making decisions, you're paying for all that time. Uh, so that can get pretty expensive pretty quick. Um, that, so that's a disadvantage. The advantages, a couple of advantages of, advantages of arbitration. The first is it's probably going to move along a little faster than court. And that's not always the case, but, but usually I would say it is. Um, the next thing that's going to be uh, an advantage of arbitration is you can select a decision maker with knowledge related to your dispute. And that's necessarily specific to the exact dispute, but the subject matter of the dispute. And this is why you see construction cases and securities cases go to arbitration, because the, uh, those parties can select an arbitrator familiar with that area of law in that industry, and which greatly facilitates uh, the resolution of the problems. And that's very helpful if you don't have to spend time educating the decision maker. And once again, this is an advantage and a disadvantage also, potentially. The arbitrator just renders a decision. They listen to the evidence, very similar to a judge would. They review the documents, and they give you a decision. And, and that decision uh, most typically is not appealable or appealable for very limited grounds. So it's a final decision. It's over, which, once again, can be an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, the next uh, frequently used uh, way to resolve disputes is just litigation, which is just filing a lawsuit. The, you know, and lawsuits have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the, one of the important disadvantages is uh, it's usually pretty expensive, for, especially for contested disputes. Uh, you, you almost always need a lawyer. Uh, there are formal and strict procedures that are very difficult to navigate if you don't have an attorney. Um, people do file lawsuits and prosecute lawsuits without an attorney, but uh, it's, it's not a very good way to go. And frequently, they are doing things that hurt their case uh, because they don't have legal advice. So usually, you have to have a lawyer to really be effective in a lawsuit, and, you know, and it can get expensive. That can obviously get expensive. Now, of course, in a lawsuit, the judge decides the dispute. And, and, then, and then you can appeal. Um, in state court, you could go to the Court of Appeals and possibly to the Utah Supreme Court. In federal court, you can go through the Tenth Circuit and up to the Federal Circuit Court, uh, or the, and to the Federal Supreme Court. So uh, that appeal process is, can be slow and you know, at least a year. And that's one of the major disadvantages of, of lawsuits is they can just be slow. Um, it's important to understand with lawsuits, though, 95% uh, of lawsuits settle before they get to trial. Uh, so maybe one out of 20 cases that's filed actually goes to trial. And, and that's because, you know, all the reasons we've talked about why lawsuits, the disadvantages, which would be, you know, the, the time and the expense, that forces people to talk. So you get ongoing negotiation and frequently mediation, sometimes court-ordered, in the process. And you know, 19 out of 20 cases get resolved one way or another, usually through mediation or negotiation, before a uh, case gets to trial. So you know, the filing of a lawsuit almost never means that you're going to go to trial. It's, it's, it usually means that you're going to end up in one of these other cases, but you're going to usually spend a little money before you get there. The uh, next thing I want to talk about briefly, because it can be so important, is small claims court cases, and they're a subset of litigation because you are in court. And they have their oh, a number of advantages and one um, very serious disadvantage um, that makes it so it's not very helpful in a lot of HOA disputes. But it's important to understand this process and understand it's out there because in some disputes, it's a very good way to get things resolved. Small claims court is obviously less expensive. Uh, you, you, know, you file a one-page document. You get a hearing. You show up. You pitch your case, you get a decision. There's one appeal uh, where either side can appeal. And then um, once you get that one appeal, which would be for a district court judge, which is basically just a do-over, 
uh, you present the trial again, and then you're done. No more appeals. Um, small claims court, like other litigation, you get a judge that decides the dispute. Uh, the parties present the evidence. Um, you make your arguments, whatever you want to make, legal or factual, and then a judge decides. Uh, the procedures are pretty relaxed. It's, it's fairly easy to prosecute a case by yourself in small claims court. Now, and that, that gets to one of the disadvantages of small claims court is you, you get what I call shoot from the hip legal analysis, which essentially means there's no briefing. Um, unless you bring it to court with you cases, and which frequently happens, people will hire lawyers and take them to small claims court, court and the lawyers will argue cases. Uh, I judged small claims court for several years and about you know, one out of four cases, maybe one out of three cases would have lawyers on one or both sides. So uh, it's, you know, you can lose, use lawyers in small claims court and they certainly help out. Um, but the, the, when I say that shoot from the hip legal analysis, I'm talking about the, the problem with either a lack of briefing by the parties or a lack of time for the judge to absorb that, brief, absorb that briefing and really a judge who fairly typically is going to have no subject matter knowledge, especially related to an HOA dispute. Uh, small claims court judges are just volunteer attorneys, um, like I was, and you, you know they might practice in divorce law or real estate or litigation or whatever it is and have their little specialty uh, that they do and then they show up and are, you know, they have to rule on all sorts of issues. So uh, you're, you're getting shoot from the hip legal analysis unless you're pretty careful up front with your, with your lawyer, uh, with getting a lawyer and, and trying to educate the court at the hearing. Um, the, the most serious disadvantage of small claims court is you can only resolve a money dispute. So judges in small claims court can't order anybody to do anything or not do anything. Uh, frequently in HOA dis, uh, disputes, that's part of the problem. Somebody wants to do something and they can't or you know, something like that. So uh, in small claims court, those, those kinds of disputes just don't work. Uh, you, you just can't get the relief you need. But um, if, you, if it's just about money, small claims court can work uh, pretty well. Uh, another important point to make is, uh, at least in Sandy uh, and some other courts, uh, you're required to mediate before you can even get a trial date. So small claims court forces you into mediation also, and the uh, there's usually a negotiation that goes on at small claims court uh, between the parties because half the time you're sitting around for two or three hours waiting for your case to come up. So you see these other two components of mediation and negotiation in small claims court also. So uh, that's the, the first part. Um, and I'll, I'll be taking questions when we get done. So if you have any questions, hang on to them. The, the, uh, now I want to talk about the specific issues related to HOA mediation. And, and when I talk about HOA mediation, I mean resolving disputes in mediation that center on HOA issues. Now, HOA disputes look like a lot of different disputes. They, they can arise out of a lot of different problems. And, and these are just some of the disputes you'll, you'll, you're, typical, you're going to run into typically, and especially as an HOA lawyer. Um, which is what we do. We see these kinds of disputes all the time. Um, the first kind of dispute you're going to run into, and this is probably the most frequent, are disputes between owners and associations. And these arise out of a lot of different issues, um, architectural design, rule enforcement, um, requests for service animals, and the, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, the second type of disputes you see in HOAs are disputes between owners and other owners. Um, the most frequent kinds of disputes are noise issues, someone's too noisy in their unit and affecting somebody else. Um, we recently dealt with a smoking dispute where smoke is going from one unit to another unit. Um, and there all, th these disputes can take all different kinds of disputes also. Uh, another type of dispute you see in community associations or HOAs are disputes between um, associations or owners and developers. And sometimes these center on warranty disputes and construction nuisances, um, how assessments are being spent. And typically during the period of developer control is when these issues might come up. 
Um, also, I guess they can come up after, if you, especially if a developer is continuing construction after they've turned over control. Another type of dispute you see, you know, pretty, not, not frequently, but once in a while in associations are disputes between associations and managers. And, you know, these disputes come up under a lot of different issues. I would say the most frequent um, cause that I see of these disputes is a lack, of, uh, the expectations of the parties are not the same. Um, and these, these come from contract issues and, and issues of representation when, you're, when they're being signed up. Uh, managers are always eager to uh, explain how they're going to take care of everything. Um, and and on, the, on the other side, board members are uh, think that their manager is going to take care of everything. And, but when you get into the nuts and bolts of managing an association, you know, everything costs money and, and th that can be a source of disputes. And there can be other dis disputes regarding specific services, um, specific actions taken, things like that. So um, you see those disputes come up. Another kind of dispute you'll run into is between association and vendors. Uh, this might be the landscaping company um, or something like that. And I, I didn't get it on the list, but there is one other kind of dispute that, you'll, that you frequently see in associations, and these are disputes between board members. So one board member will think that the HOA documents say this, another will think that they say this, and, and they can start infighting, and, or it could be personal issues or election issues or politic issues. You'll see those kinds of disputes. So HOAs are, you know, unfortunately uh, ripe ripe fields for uh, disputes. So the next issue, next thing I want to talk about is what are the, the problems with traditional HOA mediation and litigation, um, specifically mediation. And, and when I say that, I mean when you take an HOA problem and you, you just walk into a typical mediation scheme, what are some of the issues you run into and why that sometimes doesn't work very well? The first problem you can run into is, like we were talking about the problem with small claims court, sometimes what people need are somebody to do something or not do something. There's very little money or no money involved. And that can create a problem because in traditional mediation, you know, you need to pay the mediator. And that can be, you know, thousands of dollars if, if a lot of time is prepared for preparation or required for preparation, or if the mediator runs into two or three or four or five hours, you know, that could be $150 an hour, $100 an hour, and that can really add up. Especially if you, and, and if you, if you're dealing with a mediator and an HOA problem, um, frequently you, you'll need an attorney to, to educate the mediator on the law um, that should be, that the mediator should be thinking about uh, to get some context of the dispute, and that's through that mediation brief. So you might need a lawyer also to, to bring the mediator up to speed. Once again, all that can be expensive. Um, the next problem you run into is HOA problems can be really complicated. Um, HOAs are complicated entities. They're, you have multiple documents that can apply to a problem, bylaws, articles of incorporation, declaration, the plat, the rules. Then you have various statutes that can apply. It, in a condominium, it would be the Condominium Act. In a uh, PUD, it's going to be the Community Association Act. Then you could have the Revised Nonprofit Corporation Act. If you're dealing with service animals, you might have federal law. Um, and you could have the Revised Nonprofit Corporation Act applicable to these types of disputes. So it's, it really is complicated Negoti negotiating these various documents and trying to figure out what applies and, and the law that applies. And in addition to all that, you have common law cases. So um, that can be a real problem uh, for uh, traditional mediators and, uh, in a mediation because there's just such a learning curve to figure out what's going on. And that next line item is, you know, obviously the same issue. There, there aren't that many lawyers, judges, and mediators skilled in HOA law, so you, you're, you're left with that problem. Um, another really serious issue, and we've seen this come up a couple different times, is there are pretty serious constraints on resolving HOA problems, many HOA problems, that aren't understood by mediators. And so, for example, uh, 
you know, you might have a declaration that requires a certain assessment amount. And the, you know, an owner might be arguing that the square footage of their unit is different than another unit. Um, maybe should, they should pay less in assessments or something else. Or, or maybe the board agreed for them to, that they could pay less assessments, something like that. A mediator might presume that an association or a board has authority to negotiate um, that assessment level. And that could be something that ends up in a mediation agreement, that, you know, they'll pay this level of assessments as some compromise on the, as part of the bigger dispute. And, you know, a, any HOA lawyer will look at you and tell you that that's impossible. Um, the board has no authority to negotiate greater or lower assessments for a particular person. In effect, they're trying to amend the declaration, which is typically where assessments are defined, without the approval of the owners. Uh, and there's Utah case law right on point. So those types of constraints exist both in the law and in the documents. And it, an mediator, um, especially if they're not advised by lawyers on one side or the other who are HOA lawyers, might think that you can come to some agreement um, that violates those constraints. And that agreement's going to fall apart at some point, either later down the road when somebody figures it out or, or even far later down the road when maybe some money's changed hands and all of a sudden you find out that that agreement's unenforceable. And that can be a pretty serious problem. The final um, problem with traditional HOA mediation that, that I've seen is a lot of disputes really set, HOA disputes among owners versus owners and owners versus boards and boards versus board members versus board members and um, especially those internal disputes, it's really just a lack of understanding of the applicable law and those issues. Um, and HOA, basic HOA issues. Now, someone who's knowledgeable in the area can a lot of times diffuse the dispute with just some simple explanations and citations to statutes or laws or, or the declaration, and they just go away. I mean, the whole problem could be solved in minutes. Um, in a traditional HOA mediation, with it, where you have a mediator who's usually not going to have any um, understanding, you know, basic understanding of HOA law, you just wouldn't have that solution. Um, the mediator will just treat it like a regular problem. They typically won't be aware of those issues, and they just, uh, you know, can end up banging their head against people for no reason. Um, so those are some of the some of the bigger problems with. Uh, trying to fit an HOA dispute in traditional mediation. Now, that gets us to, of course, the solution. Um, and this, this solution came about in part because uh, there was an effort several years ago to expand the authority of the Utah Ombudsman to include HOA disputes. And as HOA lawyers, you know, we were obviously terrified that now you're going to have a third party with no HOA experience trying to resolve disputes, which is very similar to the problems you run into with mediation. And the thought was, at least out of that process, and that, that ombudsman issue, you know, died a, a quick death in the legislature. There wasn't the appetite for either the expense or the, the um, problems that it, that it created. But from that process uh, came the idea of, what about a, a mediation that's specific to HOAs? And how would that come about and who would do it? And the obvious answer was um, CAI, the Community Association Institute, who's putting on this program. They understand the industry. We're the, you know, members like me and many other HOA managers and attorneys and, and um, industry professionals who understand HOA, HOA issues um, could come up with a mediation program and tailor it to the, to the HOA, typical HOA problems. And so that's what we did. And we've been working on it for the last couple of years, and it's ready to roll out and um, should be available uh, very soon. And I, and I think the easy way to access this mediation will be um, on the CAI website, and then there'll be some efforts mm -hmm. to 
uh, advertise the mediation and get it into the community. Um, certainly, managers and the people involved in HOAs will have uh, information about this. And hopefully, uh, this program can provide a uh, good alternative to the problems of traditional mediation and litigation and uh, to solve problems where you can't negotiate or facilitate a resolution. Now, so let's just walk through some of the advantages of a program like this that's run by people in the industry. Um, first thing is, like I just explained, the people who are running a program and setting it up understand HOAs. Um, the next, and this is a super important factor for the reasons we just discussed or I just explained, you can have mediators who are really experts in HOAs. And CAI can control and will control that mediator list, so there will be options, but just not just anybody is going to get on that list. These are people who are going to have demonstrated some experience uh, with HOAs and hopefully take away a lot of the problems and, and create some tremendous advantages for people who participate in the process. Uh, the next thing is there can be and there, there will be co-mediator options. And this means you might have an HOA lawyer and maybe an HOA owner um, who co-mediate a dispute and bring different perspectives. So you can build buy-in and confidence from the participants in the mediator. I mean, you might, participants in the mediation, you might have an owner who's interested in mediation but certainly doesn't want to have a manager uh, resolve a dispute because they might think that the manager is beholden to the board or has a biased view of things. So you could add an owner mediator to that and, and have some expertise and get some buy-in from, from two different perspectives. Another key issue here is a lower cost. And the, the chapter program is designed to be significantly less expensive uh, than traditional mediation. And what you're going to get are people like me and lawyers at our firm who will be volunteering, basically, or obviously paid much less than their normal hourly rate to mediate cases. Um, the target really is maybe $100 for a two-hour mediation. So a mediator would be getting paid basically a couple hundred dollars for prep time and showing up. So there's some compensation for their time. And more importantly, there's some buy-in from the parties. They know that there's an expense associated with it. Even though it's not out of reach, it's, it's a, you know, $100 is $100. And that way, the process is much more likely to succeed, I think, if, if, if everybody has some buy-in. The mediator has their time and the parties have some money. But obviously, $100 aside for two hours of mediation is much less expensive than a typical traditional mediation. And um, uh, if you needed lawyers to be involved, lawyers too. Uh, the next thing you're going to the advantage is um, you're going to see some advertising like I talked about. Um, no lawyers are needed, uh, but they're certainly welcome. Uh, if people want to bring their lawyer, they can. Uh, but I think you're going to find in these HOA mediations that really most non-HOA lawyers, lawyers who don't practice in the area, they're just they're going to you know they're not really going to do much um, because ideally with with professionals and experts in the industry conducting the mediation, they should be really good at keeping the parties on track and within those constraints um, that exist. Uh, the next thing that's um, really unique to this process, and one of the things I'm really excited about, about this HOA mediation program is there's a system to encourage mediation and communication. Uh, the typical mediation process requires both parties to agree beforehand uh, to mediate. And then they reach out and find a mediator and, and, and then they mediate. Well, in, frequently in disputes between owners and board members, nobody's thinking about mediation. Uh, they're just thinking about the dispute. Now, if somebody reaches out to the, the uh, CAI website and wants to mediate, and we'll walk through this in a second, there's going to be an entire track to try to get the other party involved. So even if the other party isn't on board when you, when you sign up, 
there, there's going to be an effort by CAI to try to bring that other person in either to a meeting to discuss the issues or to convince them to come in and mediate uh, through a, a real effort. Um, you know, me, traditional mediators don't do that. Uh, they just, when the two people are ready, they sign up and they go forward. This program will have that built in. And then also, if one party just refuses to meet or mediate, there'll be a, a lawyer referral at the end to try to, you know, keep the dispute moving toward a resolution. You know, as, as, as Judge Jenkins told me once in court many years ago, sometimes the easy way is the hard way. And at the end of the day, you need to get disputes resolved. And if, if people really can't sit down in a room, then, you know, you get a lawyer, you file a lawsuit, you do what you need to do. So these are the things that uh, are the real advantages with HOA mediation. Now I'm going to walk through a chart and just show how the mediation works. And I'm going to be, you know, this might look a little complicated, but I think you're going to see as we move through it, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's actually, I mean, there are a lot of steps in mediation, but it, the process is uh, pretty simple. Um, the first thing you start over here on the left, and there's a request for mediation that's received. Now, that mediation could come from two people who have decided they want to mediate. Maybe the parties have already talked about it, which if they do, it'll drop down into this, this lower timeline uh, or list of events. Um, but like I said, the important thing about this, pack, this program is it'll also have an option where, where you only have one party who gets on the website and says, I want to mediate this dispute, but either I, I can't get the other person to agree or I haven't talked to them about it and I don't know how to approach them about it, um, can you help me? So let's walk through that first. So let's assume somebody uh, presents, uh, fills out a form and says, I have a dispute with uh, my neighbor, um, they're way too noisy on weekends, it's driving me crazy, I'm calling the police, now they don't like me, it's creating other problems. Can, can you help me with this problem? So the first thing that's going to happen up here is they're going to get a, a certain amount of information that they need to fill out about the other party, address, phone number, a little bit about the dispute, things like that. Then what's going to happen is the chapter will send out a letter um, to that person and say, hey, we understand you have this dispute with your neighbor. They've contacted us. They'd like to mediate or talk about the problem. Are you interested in doing that? And that will be this next step, a request for mediation or meeting. Um, now, three things can happen from that request. The first is the person could either not respond or write back and say, drop dead. I don't, I don't want to talk to anybody. Um, so if that happens, you just go to this upper track. Um, you'll report back to the administrator who's running the program. And then um, you're going to try one more time. So another letter is going to go out. And it's going to say, are you sure, you know, really, 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 this is a great way to solve disputes. We have a good program. Um, you want to try. Now, if they say no at that point, uh, then uh, you're just off. You give the lawyer a referral packet to the other person. Say, here's someone who you might try to find to help help yourselves out, uh, help you out. And then, and then you're off to a survey, and, and, you know, that's the end of that. I mean, obviously, mediation requires two parties to show up and agree to talk. And if one party won't, um, you're not going to mediate anything. But as you can see, this program tries a couple times to get people involved. Now, if you go back over here to where you requested the mediation training to the third party, um, if that person says, hey, you know, I don't really want to mediate. I'm not going to pay 100 bucks, but I'm willing to meet. Then maybe you go to this meeting process. Now a couple things can happen from just even meeting with the other party. You could have a resolution, in which case you're done and gone. Um, or you might have no resolution. And then you come over here and the question would be, are they willing to mediate at that point? Uh, it's kind of funny, refuse medication. Sorry about the error. Um, the, uh, uh, I had that error early in at a, uh, a conference and someone said, yeah, you need a lot of medication in mediation. but. Um, which, you know, sometimes can be true, the same as litigation. But the, anyway, so the, if you don't get a resolution and they refuse mediation, you, you go back to the 
letter follow-up, once again trying to convince them, please let us help you solve this dispute. Uh, if they don't want to do that, then you're back out to the you know, lawyer referral packet and off you go. Now a couple things can happen back if we go back over to this request for mediation or meeting. Um, if they agree to mediation or if they meet and then you don't get a resolution but then they agree to mediation, you just drop back over into the mediation program. So now you have two parties willing to mediate and you get there either through the top, which is you know one person starting, or you get there with both parties agreeing. So the first thing that's going to happen, you're going to get a mediation packet, which is going to provide some information about mediation, um, the mediation agreements, a list of mediators, and I, I didn't want to bring all the forms up to complicate everything, but I'll just summarize those as we go through. And the first thing that's going to be important is you can select your mediator, and there'll be a list of people and what their occupations are, are they attorney, a manager, or whatever they are, and to decide who's you know, qualified to, and these are all people that CAI will have decided are qualified to mediate. So you get the packet, you submit your applications. Now, um, an important part of a mediation and dispute resolution process, and remember we're talking about people who may have just been yelling from one driveway to the next, is to exchange position statements and responses. And this is a this alone can solve a lot of problems. If you just get people to write on and write down what they think the dispute is, what their position is, what they think their the the other party's position is, and and a few other simple questions, you exchange those. And that might get them communicating and solve the problem. Um, the other thing you're going to be doing in, in this time is you're going to notify the mediator of that they were selected. Now a mediator has to run through a conflicts check check. And so occasionally a mediator can't serve. Um, or they're busy or the timing doesn't work, whatever it is. So then you have to drop back in here and select a new mediator and, and you'll just communicate with the parties and get that done. So when you finally get a mediator to accept, um, then you schedule a mediation, you have the mediation, ideally a two hour time period, some mediations go longer, some are shorter, and then you're going to have a couple different things come out of the mediation. Either you're going to resolve it or you're not. If you don't, the parties get their lawyer, lawyer referral packets and they move on. Uh, if you resolve it, then you just go to the survey and try to get some feedback on the process. So that's the process. Um, and uh, um, it's pretty simple. I mean, even though the chart looks a little complicated, but it's basically just a, an effort to get people to, uh, into resolve disputes and, and provide a flow chart so the people running the program understand what's going to happen and the people participating in the program understand what happens. So with that, um, I'm going to answer any questions. That's, that's really the end. Um, um, I'll take any questions from anybody who has questions. The first question is, is there a monetary limit on how much a small claims court can handle? Yes, um, probably should have mentioned that. That's a good question. Uh, the monetary limit in, in Utah is $10,000. Um, so you can, you can handle some pretty significant disputes in small claims court, but anything over $10,000, uh, you're out of luck. I have a couple other questions. One question is, how frequently is mediation successful? So it's different based on you know different circumstances but in my experience uh, mediating at small claims court uh, to work on getting hours for a court certification uh, I've successfully mediated every dispute I've had and I would say that the success rate at small claims court is probably 70 percent of the small claims court cases are uh, resolved and and I would say just in in outside of that context more than 50% of cases are resolved in mediation I got another question um, I have seen mediation requirements in contracts uh, and for example medical appointment forms but what can an association do to require or encourage mediation with or between their members uh, that's a, a good observation uh, mediation can be required in documents. 
Uh, you'll occasionally see a mediation requirement in a declaration for certain types of disputes. The parties have to mediate. I'm, I'm not a fan of those requirements because, as we discussed with mediation, it really requires two parties who are interested in sell, settling the dispute and really are willing to compromise to some extent. And if you have a party who's really not willing to compromise, uh, mediation's really just a waste of time uh, and money. And uh, I've been to those mediations before. Courts will sometimes order mediations. You show up, nothing's going to happen. You know nothing's going to happen. Nothing does happen. And it's, it can be a real waste of time. Um, there's always some chance of success, but it's, you know, the, best, the best prospects for mediation are two parties who are willing to compromise and do want to settle. So um, the next question is, is there binding versus non-binding mediation? And the answer is no. Um, that's the whole point of mediation. Mediation requires the agreement of the parties. And when, you're, when you start talking about the words binding and non-binding, the binding sense is really arbitration. And that's a third party who you are paying to resolve your dispute. You're going to present the evidence and they are going to decide, and everybody's bound by that decision. Uh, so uh, there's no such thing as binding mediation, because if it's binding, it's not mediation. Uh, next question, um, do mediators uh, help one person or the other in the mediation? Uh, the answer is no. Um, it's an interesting issue, because mediators do have you know, especially when they have knowledge about the subject matter, they can get involved and say, hey, maybe this law applies or this declaration, things like that. Especially the kind of mediation we're looking at for HOAs, which could certainly be to the advantage or disadvantage of one party or the other. And that's just part of the process and, and trying to facilitate a resolution without lawyers, um, without um, ongoing problems, you're going to have that. But generally, and, and legally, mediators must stay neutral. They're, they do not, they're not on one side or the other. And, and when I was speaking of that conflicts check, that's exactly why they do a conflicts check, to make sure that they're not biased in one way or the other, and they can come into the mediation with a neutral, neutral approach. Next question is, uh, can a mediator or parties be called as witnesses for what was said in a mediation? Uh, the answer is no. So the mediator cannot be called as a witness, um, and neither can either party be asked to testify about what was said in the mediation. It's confidential as a matter of law. Um, we actually have a case right now where that's an issue, and the uh, mediator's being called to testify, and all, all the mediator's going to say is there was a mediation. Next question. Uh, what happens if you don't settle the dispute in a mediation? Um, well, then you're left with the other alternatives, which is uh, which are usually going to be either arbitration or litigation, and almost always that's going to lead to litigation, where either in small claims court or regular court you you resolve the dispute. I think we're finished. Thanks everyone for attending, and uh, I hope this was informative, and I hope you find a way to. Uh, reach out and use the uh, Utah CAI uh, mediation program. It's a great program. I think it's going to solve a lot of problems and save people a lot of money. Thanks.